Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? CCA Radio. CCA Radio is part of Cornerstone Community Alliance. My name is Paolo from North London and I am a proud supporter of CCA Radio. The vital work that they are doing to bring loving parents and children together is groundbreaking and has my full support. My name is Jodie Gibson. I'm from Brighton within the UK. I'm a proud supporter of CCA Radio because they cover issues that many organisations wouldn't. They're for the people and about getting people's voices heard. The campaign for parental alienation is one I am very proud to support. Hi, my name's Michael from Hertfordshire and I'm a proud supporter of CCA Radio. I think what they're doing is great. They're bringing issues which need to be spoken about more into the public domain and they have my full support. Welcome to this week's episode with myself, Mark Shepherd, and today we'll be discussing about Kafkas and today's show will be an extended version. For those of you who do not know who Kafkas is, this is a direct extract from their website. Kafkas stands for Children and Family Court Advisory and Support Service. Kafkas represents children in family court cases in England. We put children's needs, wishes and feelings first, making sure that the children's voices are heard at the heart of the family court setting and that decisions are made in their best interests. Operating within the law set by Parliament, Criminal Justice and Court Services Act 2000 and under the rules and directions of the family courts, we are an independent of the courts, social services, education and health authorities and all similar agencies. Today I will be speaking to Lee who is a mental health support worker, an alienated father and a campaigner for equal family rights. Remember the CCA radio platform is not about me but about people and who want a voice for change and to share your experiences with the world. Today, I have Lee, who's going to be discussing with me about CAFCAS and how they work within the family court setting. Um, Lee, if you could just sort of introduce yourself um, and and how you got involved with CAFCAS. Yeah, hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on. My name's Lee. I'm what's known as an alienated parent. So I've got children. Um, I have been alienated against them by the other parent. Um, I have been, shall we say, um, working with um, or trying to work with CAFCAS to try and better for a better outcome for my children following the separation of myself and their and their other parent. Um, I been the, the my case my personal case was open to CAFCAS for the best part of two and a half years it has recently closed um I'll, I'll kind of talk around it I won't talk about it as such but yeah that's that's so I I, I would say that I've I've had quite an you know a long experienced um working relationship with CAFCAS and also I've because of the support work that I do within your organization Mark it's um, I've come across many, many cases, so I kind of get a, a, a good I get a good kind of um, overview. Indication. Get overview. I, I get a good overview of what, how CAFCAS manages a, a large, a large volume of cases ac- across a, a wide spectrum. So but so based yeah. on the extract that I just read, which was yeah. CAFCAS represents children in family court <coughs> cases in England. We put children's needs, wishes and feelings first. So they're saying that they are the voice for the children. So the children don't necessarily have to be at court, but they're speaking on behalf 
of the children that they represent. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. So do you believe that is the case when they get involved from the start? I, well, in answer to your fir- in answer the first statement, they they represent the children. Of course, that's that's right that they represent the children because you know you, you know we, no one would want a child um, advocating for themselves in court. That's that you know that is a given you know and that's right. However, um, from not just from my own personal experience, but from the p- experience of other parents that we support. Um, when you when an organisation or an advocate of any kind um um speaks for someone else um we need to ensure that when we're speaking for someone else it is that person's thoughts feelings and voice however what i've come to see is that that kafkas are not genuinely um looking for the the actual um kind of the the children's best interests because because i mean I'm sure we'll get onto this in a minute, but parental alienation is it's a very contentious issue. It's very divisive. It, it is only it is only recognised by CAFCAS and even then only tenuously. Um, frontline staff don't know what it is. Um, CAFCAS have a whole number of frameworks, which I'm sure we'll get on to shortly. But none of these actually are um, workable if people, if frontline staff from CAFCAS don't actually understand them or have the skills in their professional toolbox, as it were, to implement them and have that pu- professional curiosity to pick out and go, right, A, B, C equals parental alienation. A, B, C doesn't equal parental alienation, but it equals mum or dad needs additional support because otherwise, you know, this relationship with other parent might become fraught. And so that's, that, 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 that's, that's the tricky thing here is because they get put in the middle. So it's like piggy little, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So they get put yeah. in the middle of two parents that could potentially be quite hostile towards each other. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. They, and they have to work out the best solution. Now, uh, do you believe that they look at a solution as opposed to just trying to sort of rush the cases through court so they can move on to the next one? Well, <clears throat> I think they, I think they look for a solution, but not the right one. I think they already have a solution in mind when they approach a case. And and what I mean by is, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, parental stereotypes. We we all bring our own. I mean, in, in our own respective professional fields, we all bring our own prejudice. You know, our bias, our subconscious bias. We all bring our life experiences, and that that's okay. But it's but it's when they're when they're laid and inf- you allow them to influence your case analysis to to such an extent that your there is a complete lack of professional curiosity for something that might you might not have come across before so what i mean is you you might have um a resident pair you might have a very high conflict um separation and there could be two or three children involved in in the former marital marit- marital home and you've got the resident parent so the non-resident parent, mum and mum and dad have had a massive argument, you know, and um, one of the parents has left. Now, the, the CAFCAS worker will then go in there because if court proceedings are then begun, CAFCAS, like you said, they come in and it's their role to look up, look after the welfare and the well-being of the children in the family court. So they will look at mum and dad and... And what I see all too often, they concentrate on the high conflict, which they they um, very often, I would say, in the majority of the cases that I've come across, they attribute equal blame to mum and dad. Now, that that's OK if if mum and dad are both very angry, are both very upset. But if that continues, if one party shows evidence they are not going to change their approach and then it goes into the realms of contact denial bad mouthing um uh kind of you know mum or dad yeah 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 so mum or dad don't want to see you anymore so basically if 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 the parent has who has that control over the the children is providing the children with a false narrative 
and they don't have contact with the targeted parent you know it's not rocket science to to figure out that those children will believe that parent that's providing the false narrative because why wouldn't they they love and they trust that parent they always have done they always have but then that false narrative buys into the fact that the absent parent not by choice i might add the absent parent isn't around to prove otherwise you see so then the children become angry with the absent parent for leaving them which you know in most cases isn't the case and they also side support an ally with the parent who is provided providing that false narrative now this false narrative can sometimes be i class it as mild to mor moderate so if it's mild to moderate what i what i mean by that is um if if a very good um kafkas worker was to come along and tell them what they were doing explain to them the damage and explain the long-term detrimental effect on the children if the person that was doing that the parent gave some kind of evidence that they were horrified and they need support in changing their approach that is a that's you know that's that's not as bad as it can get that's it's not good but it's okay so then we can get additional support kafkas are not very good at that but what they're also not very good at is the other end of the scale, which is when you have a parent who is doing the false narrative to such an extent that whether they do it consciously or subconsciously, their clear intention is to erase the relationship between the children and the absent parent. And what is very important is that that um, because this is what makes it a very multifaceted issue and a very complex, a very, you know, divisive issue. It is, it has to be, you know, this is done when there were no safeguarding concerns. There's no issue of safeguarding concerns between the targeted parent and the children. And the targeting parent, the alienating parent, will create a false narrative to such an extent that the children do not want to see the other parent anymore because of the way that, that they believe the other parent has um, acted towards them, acted towards their, their parent. So that then feeds into the children's belief that they are doing the right thing. Um, but then what happens is these children, and, and all too often at this point they're kind of pre-teens, they will then this becomes unaddressed by Kafkas because they don't have the staff. And this is something that I'm, I hope we'll get onto shortly. They these children are then left with um, fears of they're, they're left with feelings of loss, abandonment, um, rejection and, you know, and no, no kind of hope on the horizon that that, you know, there's quote unquote um, unloving parent will come back and then these children are left to go through their formative years with these feelings and we all know that the children that go through formative years with these feelings are at high risk of you know risk behaviors and social behaviors you know um substance misuse so on and so forth um and this is what i wanted to talk to you about so <clears throat> what we're saying is parental alienation could contribute to the, 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 the detriment of mental health within the children, within the family, absolutely. family setting. Absolutely. I, I'd go one step further, Mark. I'd say that, that we have a wealth of evidence out there um, uh, around parental alienation. <clears throat> um, I mean, admittedly, there isn't there isn't um, as, as much as um, any other field of abuse because it is because it is very difficult to identify um to um someone that is not not um i mean i going off going off on a tangent a bit i'm a mental health professional so i see i see parental alienation in my everyday practice when i'm not even looking for it okay um but it's the the problem with kafkas is their frontline staff are social workers so they're they're family court advisors basically they're called family court advisors they're social workers and um <clears throat> so they will they, they will be um assigned a case where mum and dad have separated and one of the parents is no longer the resident parent 
and the children uh, remain resident with the the um, other parent. Now, if there's a um, that could, all intents and purposes, be uh, an extreme case of parental alienation, should we say? So the resident parent is telling the children that you know, um, let's say in this case, it's not always dad, but you know, let's say in this case, dad has dad has left us all. Dad has stolen all our money. Dad used to beat me up. Dad never used to give you this. Dad used never used to do that. And then also, the children understandably are going to side with their mom and if you know children children are, their brains are like sponges they soak up what they're told because they they trust they trust their parents and then um that this this former healthy attachment that they would have had with the non-resident parent over time with this continuous narrative will become start to erode will start to erase and for all the attachment theories in the world, you know, you've got Bowlby's attachment theory, children are hardwired to remain attached to um, to parents, even if parents are not loving, even if parents neglect them. However, it is only the only form of abuse that I am aware of as as someone that's into, um, uh, you know, research and psychology. The only form of abuse that I am aware of that erodes that attachment is parental alienation because of the hard you know children are hardwired to remain attached to the, their parents it is only parental alienation i'm aware and there are other you know well respected pioneers in the field of parental alienation that also agree you know that a, an attachment is not easily taken away from a child it has to be worked on by someone else and this is what the fca what the kafka social worker frontline staff do not understand so saying that the, the attachment issue yeah is is a big problem when it comes to parental alienation but do you yeah. think that kafkas know how to actually implement something to solve that issue well um before you even get on that problem you've got the issue of um do they even would they know what they're looking for i mean we have their current ceo Anthony Douglas so that um, February 2017 he started coming out making public statements that you know parental alienation is a form of abuse he stated parental alienation does have a long-term impact on children's mental health it does of course have a long-term impact on the targeted parents it does destroy families you know I think there was a the statistic 70 70 percent of this is these were Kafka's figures 70 percent of um family disputes that make it into the family court where Kafka's are required to go and manage a case um can be as much as 70 percent um so and, and anthony douglas also in the same year went so far as to say you know parental alienation should be identified we need to look at a way of managing it more effectively and he also made the, uh, which, you know, was quite a big public statement at the time. We need to be treating parental alienation with the same severity as any other form of abuse. And why not? You know, um, however, we have and, and this is where, you know, I look at the incalculable number of cases that I come across from people that we support where, you know, Kafkas don't appear to know enough about it to recognize it even when it's glaringly obvious and then there's also another there's also another kind of this is my own my own kind of just personal experience from looking at other people's cases that even when they do they're they're not they're inclined to not um they're inclined to not act accordingly because they don't know how to kind of take the right number of positive risks in managing it because if they do something and it goes wrong, it comes back at them as opposed to there, there are too many people at the front line of the services that don't know enough. And there's no joined up working either. You know, that's, and you, that's what I was going to come to. So yeah. that, that is brilliant because they 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 seem to when you are if, if you're in an interview with them. Mm. They they will tell you all the things which basically hits alarm bells straight away that it's parental yeah. alienation. So they'll sit yeah. down and talk with the parents and they'll talk to the non-resident parent and say, duh, 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 you know, and they'll start listing all the sort of behaviours. 
of parental yeah. alienation, but they don't mm. actually know how to deal with it. And I think also, even if they do know how to deal with it, I think they're scared to take any action because yes. the children are with the resident parent. That, yeah. That's I mean, the other issue. They 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 could they sometimes can identify it. Not not yeah. in all cases, but sometimes they can. And if yeah. if it's if it's come to light that there is mm. signs of parent, they just actually don't know what to do. And, it, and if no. they and if they go through their frameworks, yeah. and and say it was something <laughs> drastic that needed to be done, they're afraid to do it because yeah. the kids are with the resident parent. Yeah, I, I hear all too often in people's cases where, um, you know, they are at a point where maybe CAFCAS maybe have reluctantly agreed that it is a case of parental alienation. So therefore, um, a positive risk kind of plan needs to be formulated. Um, and yes, of course, you know, in, in whether it's, um, you know, if there is some form of reconciliation with the former you know the the targeted parent of course there will be emotional fallout for those children however those the fallout will be short term and what i mean by that is that yes there will be that that is that's going to happen we can't stop that happening however what we don't want and this is this is what concerns me is by kafkas turning turning a blind eye or shying away from ha you know taking these children and, and court ordering you know contact with the targeted parents so you've got so so basically in terms of that you've got um family court advisors CAFCAS frontline staff that are fearful of an emotional um fallout from you know um supporting these children to be reconciled with with the targeted parent and because they they don't have the understanding, they don't have the mental health training, and they're fearful of of what what impact this will have on the children. And we and we hear this a lot. I hear this a lot from other people's cases and um, from other people's cases that I support them with, where a judge, even a judge, will say, you know, that too much damage has already been done. However, as a mental health professional, I would argue that okay don't really understand that but what you're saying is you're going to leave this to go downstream for these children to go through their formative years like i said with with feelings of loss rejection bereavement you know and growing up feeling unloved by one who was you know in most cases a loving healthy positive role model of a parent and um and that's what how it most cases tend to be they're just left to go downstream for these these poor children to you know surface five to ten years later you know and be at risk of like i said you know um substance misuse risk behaviors antisocial behavior potentially future mental health service users instead of kind of dealing with these issues there and then okay um, so 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 saying that then let, let's talk about solutions okay so yeah for instance, they're gonna they're gonna, they, they're gonna mention high conflict between the yeah. parents, and that that's something which seems to be the in thing now, where you're yeah. in court, everything's high conflict. But what mm. if the high conflict is only being produced by one side, right? So what if the yeah. high conflict is only one parent, and the other one is willing to do whatever's necessary? to make mm. sure those children are in both people's lives. What do CAFCAS need to do? That's a very good question. It's, it, I see case after case where um, high conflict gets misused. High conflict, as far as I'm concerned, is a get out clause for CAFCAS. So they will come in and they will look at mum, they will look at dad and they will look at the children. Um, and they will ask the children. And even if the children say, I don't want to see mum or dad ever again, they hurt, you know, mum or dad. They hurt us. You know, even if there's false allegations, which then are deemed to be unfounded, um, the the CAFCAS workers will write down this and they call it thoughts and feelings. OK, so the children have been children are basically paraphrased what the resident parent is saying. So those are not the children's thoughts and feelings. They're the children's 
par <laughs> statements being told um, from the other parent for them what to, what to say to the frontline Kafkas worker, um, and then and then we get this this high conflict um, uh, dynamic, which is then presented to a judge, presented to children's services, and 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 that rhetoric gets carried all the way through the case. And I see case after case where the targeted parent will jump through as many hoops as possible, will ask how to evidence that, you know, what they've done. They'll go on co-parent co-parenting uh, co courses. They'll go to, you know, they'll go and see their GP. Maybe they're not sleeping well. Maybe it's affected their mental health. Of course it would. Why wouldn't it? Um, and they come back and they evidence that to Kafkas. And yet the the parent that is alienating um, is not, I don't ever see them being um, firmly asked or told to engage in such um, reflections on their behaviour or change their behaviour. And yet if it doesn't work because the alienating parent is refusing to change, it doesn't matter how many hoops the targeted parent jumps through. I am yet to see a case where where um, all the professionals involved have named it as high conflict and then turned it into no, it's this person. It, it's rare. It's incredibly rare. And, and my my cynical mind is that um, a high conflict statement gets services out of um, taking on responsibility and making because difficult decisions. Absolutely, because then you're left with a judge having to make a decision that is against the general standard there is no gold standard for judges there is no there is no reflection on current case law so you'll have a judge that will think if i do this and it goes wrong i'm the only one in the last year and a half or so that would have made this judgment and if it goes wrong uh that's that's kind of my neck on the line so i'm so just going to go People out there are going to be sitting there going, I've never, yeah, experienced, I've never experienced court, I've never been in court, but now I'm in court and I have Kafka yeah. social workers, you know, social services, I have all these people around me, guardians. Yeah. How, how do I, how mm. do I work with an organisation that will throw in yeah. high conflict all yeah. the time, yeah. but not allow me to well, have that relationship with my child? Well, this is, I mean, this is what you, I know you're asking us, you're asking the question for the benefit of the listeners. So this is what, I mean, this is what you and I do day in, day out, isn't it? So we, we, we there's a two, there's a two step process, isn't there? The, um, half of our organisation is about supporting people to navigate the system with the way that it is at the moment, because we can't change the way that it is at the moment overnight. So we need to support people to navigate their way through it with what we have. That's not perfect. And then on the long term, we know where the issues are. We know what the magic wand gold standard approach would be. And that's our long term issue. I mean, we have in our, as you know, in our, in our um, community, we have people, you know, we all have different stories. We all have different experiences. None of us have positive experiences. And yet we're all targeted parents, grandparents, you know, aunts, uncles, step parents. But what is what is um, quite alarming is that we all have a basic we all have the same basic template to all of our stories. And I call these indicators and these are indicators that frontline staff, if they had the training, the expertise, the integrity, that these indicators would point and and kind of um, kind of guide their ears to pick up. Yeah, and they would go. Actually, this is parental alienation. But even when I, I also, you know, it, it's so multifaceted. It's such a multifaceted issue that even when they suspect it, they're going to be the only one in that ward culture that is going to be putting forward. Um, a statement of parental alienation because because um kafkas the, the whole um it, it's it's kind of the whole institution so that the work culture needs to change so 
in answer to your question what what you know people that are listening what what do they need to do they need to find someone to help them and support them navigate their way through the system as it is now because it like i said it can't be it can't be fixed can't be worked overnight so but but you can't do that alone we can't we can't allow people to go and people are thinking well what can kafkas do to to improve well well what can kafkas do to improve well i mean kafkas need to i mean i i I I will be or have always advocated for you know this is the long this part of our long term total reform change isn't it about I I sincerely believe that we have the wrong people doing the wrong jobs so um, so do you think I, it comes down to training or is it guidance is it I just management? think it's the, I just think, well a bit of both frontline staff um you know there is a role and a place for social workers don't get me wrong in uh, as a mental health professional i work alongside social workers day in and day out and they do a fantastic job however um if you send um a social worker to a house where a a parent is potentially you know has been reported as exhibiting signs personality traits indicative of parental alienation a social worker wouldn't know what to look for because um Evidence informs us that parental alienation and its most severe form is normally perpetrated with people that have fixed, rigid personality traits. Now, that then kind of veers into the context and the field of mental health. Now, mental health and social workers, you know, social workers do one module on mental health. Mental health professionals, that's their bread and butter. So you could have a mental health professional who is an assessor that would go in there and and you know in a very short space of time they would be able to ask right the right questions assessment and come out feeling confident or not confident confident whether that parent is prepared to change their approach to change the way that they are talking about the non-resident parent in the eyes of the children and also are, are the children's rejection of the non-resident parent um appropriate are they proportionate you know uh, mum and dad have had an argument mum or dad have having had an affair the kids never want to see that parent again now all of that information shouldn't really be shared with the children i know i know in the heat of the moment you know there's no such thing as a successful breakup but none of that information should be shared with children uh, it, it, there's a, there's a difference between intentional and unintentional if it's intentional to hurt the other parent to turn the children against them then that really should be working that that should speak for itself it, it, so, it's so, it's that. But, that, but that's what i mean we, 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 yeah people really want to know now is is because a lot of people would have gone through the kafka system yeah had the interviews had them attend court etc mm. et all they want to know is they've not had the outcome that they needed so yeah. what do we think would be able to change with Kafkas for the outcomes to be more positive. Well, I mean, they have the they have the toolkits in place, but they just don't they don't apply them to um, to parental alienation. I mean, they've got a child impact assessment framework. They've got a they've got um, a high conflict um, parental checklist. They've got various other tools. However. Um, they don't have an understanding of mental health. Um, so so you know, what you're saying is each Kafka officer should be assigned a mental health worker to, to work alongside them? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, no, no. What I'm saying is um, that they should, Kafka should be, should be staffed by, um, so the frontline staff, their FCAs, uh, family court advisors, should be a mix. So they should have mental health practitioners, uh, this is this is in a in an ideal world, mental health practitioners, social workers, not one person dual trained in both, but right. separately. So okay. uh, at some point, so at some point, um, someone gets the safeguarding referral, you know. So what what will happen quite often in genuine case, uh, cases of parental alienation, the perpetrator of the parental alienation, the resident parent, will n normally in many cases. Um, ping off a um, two services or get a letter from the GP of um, allegations of domestic abuse abuse perpetrated by the non-resident parent to the children. Now, in, in in the cases that I've come across, 
They're all unfounded, they're unsubstantiated, but no one does anything about it. But what that does is that then, understandably, until you find out whether it's true or not, the court will then order no contact between the targeted parent and the children. And that can last up to three to four months. During that period, the parent, whatever is driving those behaviours, is going to then do their utmost to target or badmouth or alienate the, the targeted parent against the children. So when the safeguarding concerns are then ruled out and there aren't any, the, the parent is then permitted to go and see the children, but the children don't want to see them. And then you have Kafkas coming back saying, well, we've done a wishes and feelings report and the children said that they don't want to see you. But this is not normal. This is not ordinary. This is not what children do. You see, so you need you need a bit of professional curiosity. You need these frontline staff to go in there and be saying, why? What is it? Is it justified? Is it proportionate? What how did they view their parent before the separation? You know, so if you go there, I, I so we not get don't digress into your, your question. Yeah, we, we, need Mark. Just so, we need to wrap it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so basically it would be a joint a joint visit so basically it goes a, the first initial joint visit would always be a safeguarding visit yeah so it would be um a mental health practitioner and a social worker okay and they both do a joint visit on the resident parent and between them the social worker would look at social social needs and you know are they meeting um kind of educational milestones or this that and the other the mental health practitioner would be looking at the person's presentation you know, have they um, are, are they aware of, of what they're doing? Have they got any insight into their into their negative behaviours towards their children? Now, if they haven't, then that then goes into the realms of, um, you know, mental health. Is this person doing this to an extreme nature? Are they causing are they causing significant levels of emotional harm to these children? Are they are they able to budge? Do they have any insight? Do, are they put presented with certain personality traits that were indicative of some kind of mental health personality disorder that is unchangeable so far and and then depending on the severity if it is mild and moderate my argument would be that it sits with the case being managed by a social worker with support from the mental health professional however if it's severe and if we left it any longer come next week these kids will not ever want to see their other parent again. It then sits with the prof mental health professional managing that case with a social worker secondary. And then right. that way, there's a pathway. There's a clear pathway. So, so that joint visit is like a triage. They triage it and they identify it. And you've got such a broad wide but, skill. But do you think the reason why they don't do this is one lack of resources um, and two that they may be, got so many caseloads because if you think about the volume of people that have yeah. to go through uh, the family court system do you not think that that may add to the the speedier responses and and lack right. of investigation when it comes to things well, like this well i think one of the main reasons they wait they're not happy for change is because lots of people lo lose their their income lots of people would be open to litigation for the you know for arguably um in, uh, you know negligence um that in itself needs to be that's that would need to be dealt with um because there's people i know numerous people as you as you do numerous people that you know their cases are just clear cases miscarriages of justice you know they're as clear as day um for kafkas to have these changes institutional changes as difficult as it is let alone when if you was to admit to that you're then leaving yourself open to you know a whole host of you know half the country perhaps being open to compensation or litigation litigation cases because a a uh, a body that claims to have the best interests of the nation's children at heart through family court really doesn't and they don't have the skill mix um, I, I do believe that they don't have the skill mix, but they're not doing enough to to address it. I to mean, it, yeah, yeah, okay, and the well, service improvements, yeah, well, service improvements shouldn't come from the staff that they've got. It just doesn't work. So, 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 so basically, they they need an overhaul. They need to absolutely, to absolutely, start from the ground up again and say, right, let's speak to people that have had um, numerous experience with Kafkas. Yeah. 
because that probably Absolutely. would help as well getting the feedback yeah. from the yeah. people that have gone through the system and and then yeah. and then say right what do you believe would help us improve the service because at the end of the day we still need a cafcast we're not saying yeah, of course. get rid of them what we're mm. saying is that it needs a lot of improvement to reach yeah. the goals the feelings Absolutely. the best interest of the children and to and to assure that that if there is signs of emotional abuse or anything within the uh, the settings that they're investigating or working alongside that they actually mm. deal with it in a robust way and, and, and not let it continue for long periods of time yeah absolutely absolutely right perfect well again thank you lee for your input on CAFCAS. Okay. and uh, yeah we'll be speaking again soon thank you very much for your time thanks for having me mark i would like to thank lee for taking the time out of his busy schedule to talk to myself about CAFCAS, being a, a, an alienated father and mental health having someone or even an organization which contributes to you not being able to see your children is just truly heartbreaking we all have to take positive steps for change and not wait for something to happen but to make it happen thank you for taking the time to listen until the next time you've been listening to myself mark shepherd here on cca radio ladies and gentlemen may i have your attention Radio. CCA Radio is part of Cornerstone Community Alliance.